Okay, so if you have a Bible, Jonah chapter 4. Jonah chapter 4. We have arrived to the final chapter of this little book, the book of Jonah. And as we examine it here tonight, we I've, I've actually been anticipating the chapter. I'm really looking forward to this chapter. Um, and I've also been excited just due to our several days, evenings together this week, that there has been a lot of good stuff, good discussion, good observation, good comments that has just perfectly set us up for this time here this evening. Many of the observations that I want to draw out and to help emphasize as we look at some of these big key themes and ideas of the book of Jonah, we try and kind of tie them all up together and summarize. Welcome. Um, We've touched upon many of them, or you guys have, in, in just the observations and comments that you have issued in these last few evenings. And, and so I anticipate that this will be a great blessing as we work our way into it. But the goal is, of course, we'll look at the chapter uh, for its own self. It's not very lengthy. It's only nine or excuse me, 11 verses. But nonetheless, as we examine the chapter for itself, I also want to spend some time trying to tie up some of the big themes that we've already seen thus far and some of the discussion topics that we've uh, been poking at here and there and adding to uh, in these last few evenings. So, so with that said, recall that this is where we've been and where we are tonight. We're looking at the book of Jonah. We spent the first evening looking at the background, and then we've taken a chapter a night. We see Jonah in chapter 1, running from God's will. Chapter 2, submitting to God's will. Chapter 3, fulfilling God's will. That was our focus last night. But then tonight, we're going to see, as I forecasted even in our introduction to this, the somewhat anticlimactic ending to the book of Job, which is namely, or excuse me, Jonah, the book of Jonah, is Jonah questioning God's will. And that's Jonah chapter 4. And, and so there's a lot of lessons here for our learning. And as I said before, even in, in the introduction, it is one of those chapters that oftentimes is neglected or sometimes even misunderstood. I've seen whole commentaries that really only talk about the first three chapters, and they don't even include chapter four in the outline, or they're not quite sure what to do with it. Um, and so it's like, some, it's evident that it is, in some circles, it's a bit of a head scratcher, but on the one hand, but on the other, it's really important. And I think if we miss chapter four, we've largely missed the whole point of the book. And so uh, I, I trust that we can see that here this evening. Now, again, just one last time, let me draw your attention back to this parallel structure that we see through the book. And the only reason I want to highlight this one more time is just to help you see how chapter four dramatically contrasts chapter two. And recall that the first two chapters are essentially paralleled by the last two chapters, where first God commissions Jonah chapter one, he then recommissions Jonah beginning of chapter three. First time Jonah disobeys God, but the second time Jonah obeys God. First time in his disobedience, he runs from God, but nonetheless, God allows uh, the events to transpire, resulting in pagan sailors coming to repentance. Well, the second time when Jonah does obey God, we also see how that brings about repentance, this time of the pagan Ninevites. But notice in particular, chapter 2, verses 1 to 10, which is Jonah's grateful prayer of deliverance how that is dramatically contrasted by what we're going to look at here this evening, which is Jonah's second prayer in the book. But rather than being a grateful prayer of thanksgiving for God's deliverance in his life, rather it's going to be the opposite. He's actually rather angry over the deliverance that God gave to his enemies. And so it is the exact opposite of chapter 2. And it's strange, and as I said, it's a bit anticlimactic in that the book ends this way. And we'll, we, we can debate about it a little bit, but at the end of the day, we don't really know what happens to Jonah. But the book ends with this dangling question that God addresses Jonah with, and it really serves them to address us as the readers and to get us to really be confronted by the same issues and tensions that Jonah himself is struggling with. And so it really has a pretty practical function. Now, with that said... Let's go ahead and take the time. Let's read these 11 verses before we jump in to begin our analysis. But if you got your Bibles, Jonah chapter 4, verse 1, the Bible says this, But it displeased Jonah. In fact, it might behoove us. Just back up one verse so you all remember where it left off in chapter 3. Look at 3.10. It says, And God saw their works 
that they, speaking of the Ninevites, turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. And he prayed unto the Lord. So notice the verb to pray parallels chapter 2, verse 1, where he's praying in chapter 2 out of thanksgiving, but now he's praying in chapter 4 out of anger. It says, and he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before unto Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. Therefore now, O Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Then said the Lord, Doest thou well to be angry? No response. Verse 5, so Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city and there made him a booth and sat under it in the shadow till he might see what would become of the city. And the Lord God prepared a gourd and made it to come up over Jonah that it might be a shadow over his head to deliver him from his grief. So Jonah was exceeding glad of the gourd. But God prepared a worm. When the morning rose the next day, and it smote the gourd, that it withered. And it came to pass, when the sun did arise, that God prepared a vehement east wind. And the sun beat upon the head of Jonah, and he fainted, and wished in himself to die, and said, It is better for me to die than to live. And God said to Jonah, Doest thou well to be angry for the gourd? And he said, I do well to be angry. Yet even, or he says, even unto death. Then said the Lord, thou hast had pity on the gourd, for the which thou hast not labored, neither made it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. And should not I spare Nineveh, that great city, wherein are more than six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand, and also much cattle? End of the book. Right? It ends with this little bit of a dangling question, and we don't know what Jonah said. We don't know his response. And again, it's like I said, it's a bit anticlimactic, and sometimes uh, it's a bit of a head scratcher, but I think that's the whole point, is the book is designed in such a way to confront us, and then the very same question that God poses to Jonah is then, of course, posed to us. We now are forced to face that very same question. Uh, or series of questions, rather. So with that said, this is how we're going to analyze this chapter, all right? First four verses is Jonah's objection toward God. Jonah's objection towards God. And then the last part of the chapter, verses 5 to 11, is God's object lesson toward Jonah. So Jonah objects, and God gives him an object lesson. And we don't know, again, if Jonah learned the lesson. Um, but nonetheless... We, that's the whole point of the book, is it poses and it says, okay, are we going to learn the lesson that Jonah was supposed to learn? So with that said, notice again the parallel between chapters 2 and 4. For scholars who see a strong parallel structure in the book, these opening verses, chapter 4, verses 2 and 3, form the counterpart to chapter 2, verses 1 to 9. In the latter, the prophet praised God for his merciful deliverance, but in the former, he cannot tolerate God's mercy when it is extended to Israel's enemies. Excuse me, I think I got that mixed up. The former, that would be chapter 2, um, the form that, that takes place first in the book. Um, he is praising the Lord for his merciful deliverance, but he can't tolerate God's mercy when it's extended to Israel's enemies in his second prayer of chapter 4. In chapter 1, the prophet ran from God's directions, but the narrative provided no explicit reason for this response. We've already spent some time conjecturing about it and debating about it, but chapter 4 provides our answer. Not that it's a one-for-one one ratio answer. I think there could be multiple factors involved, but clearly the largest factor as to why Jonah ran is given to us in chapter 4 from his own mouth. He admits why he ran in verses 2 and 3. So in chapter 4, Jonah reveals why he fled his mission, and, he, and it's namely this, because he knew God would forgive the Ninevites, and he did not want that to happen. Reread quickly in verse 2. 
It says, and he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore, I fled before unto Tarshish. He gives the, the reason. I fled. Why? For I knew that you are a gracious God, merciful, slow to anger, great in kindness, and you repent of evil. Therefore, he says, I beseech, take my life. So he's, he's clearly angry over the fact that God has given grace and mercy to the Ninevites. Now, notice again, I think it's kind of fascinating if we slow down and do a little analysis of Jonah's objection towards God, verses 1 to 4 here. Notice how in the very first verse it says, but it, it displeased Jonah exceedingly. What displeased Jonah? Well, we already backed up to reread that and make sure we remember the context. But according to chapter 3, verse 10, he is upset that God turned away. He relented from the evil that he planned toward Nineveh. Now, what's fascinating is, depending on your translation, that phrase in verse 1, chapter 4, verse 1, it says it displeased Jonah exceedingly. This is actually a particular Hebrew construction that is the greatest construction in Hebrew to emphasize something. It's the most emphatic instruction, construction, excuse me, uh, in the Hebrew language to emphasize something. And it's actually a, a, a repetition. So literally in the Hebrew, it says it was an evil, evil to Jonah. And that's why most translations won't say evil twice, right? Because it's bad English. <laughs> but it's good Hebrew. So, so in English, what do they typically do? Well, you can see it, it displeased Jonah exceedingly. Or, you know, they put some sort of, you know, uh, modifier in there to get across the, the point that in Hebrew, it's actually the word evil two times in a row. Now, what's fascinating about this is according to chapter 4, verse 1, Jonah himself is, he, he himself, notice how it's, it's switched. The first time we see the word evil in the book, it is applied to Nineveh. Remember this back in chapter 1, verse 2, God says to him, arise, go to Nineveh. That great city cry against it. Why? For their wickedness or their evil. It's in the, in the Hebrew. It's that word translated evil in chapter 4. So he says, the evil of the city has come up before the Lord. But now that the evil has been turned away from, they have repented, then now, do you see the irony? Jonah thinks that is the evil. That what is evil is that God did not destroy Nineveh. When... You know, in, in Jonah's mind, they deserved it, and they should have been destroyed. He goes on to say he was very angry. Um, again, this is kind of fascinating. When we cross-reference this with back in chapter 3, verses 9 and 10, it's ironic. Ironically, Jonah is angry over the fact that Yahweh turned from his anger that he had toward Nineveh. In other words, God's anger has been assuaged. He's no longer angry. Because of the repentance of Nineveh. But the very thing that pleases God displeases Jonah. God's anger, gone. But now Jonah has anger. Do you see? The point is, it, the text is again just designed so dramatically and so uh, purposefully to, to demonstrate that Jonah is at odds with God. He's actually viewing this situation the exact opposite as God is. Well, verses 2 and 3 I think another interesting observation, I circled this in my Bible, and you know, it's, it's, it might be worth you to do the same, but verses 2 and 3 that form Jonah's second prayer in the book, it dramatically contrasts his first prayer from chapter 2 and verse 1. But do you notice the first person pronouns, I, me, and my, appear 10 times in two verses. He has a two-verse prayer. That's it. And yet in two verses, he will say, I, me, or my, 10 times. And again, it's worthy of note as we've often pointed out with Hebrew literature, the way that words are repeated and what words are used. When we consider the typical economy, right, of, of Hebrew literature, economy meaning they say a lot with few words. And so the fact that we have these personal pronouns repeated 10 times is, again, it's emphatic. That's the point. Is Jonah is pouting, if you will, and it's all about himself. And he is upset. He's angry at the very thing that pleases God. So his values and his priorities are in conflict with God. His values are, co are completely opposite of God's values. And God has to then, as we'll see in the next few verses, he has to give an object lesson to Jonah in order to reveal to Jonah that he has perverted value system. He has a perverted value system. And so God has to gently disclose that to Jonah. 
Now, let me draw your attention to this interesting reality. If you are a very careful reader of your Bible and you like cross-referencing and parallels and all this, then notice in verse 2 that when Jonah complains about God, he actually quotes or at least alludes to one of the most famous confessions found anywhere in the Bible, and that is in Exodus 34, verses 6 and 7. Are you familiar with that context? Because if you are familiar with that context, and any original Jewish audience would have been familiar with that context, then it draws out the stark irony of this passage. In other words, let's go and just for a moment, let's, let's recreate that context. Go to Exodus 34. All right, if you got your Bible, go backwards to Exodus 34 in case this is a little rusty. But the confession that Jonah alludes to when he says, now let me just reread that in Jonah chapter 4 as you're on your way there to Exodus. Notice he says in verse 2, and, it, and he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray you, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country, therefore I fled unto Tarshish, for I knew that you are, and then he lists the famous confession, you are a gracious God, merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and you repent concerning evil. Now that list of the characteristics or attributes of God is first found in Exodus 34. So as you're there in Exodus 34, what famous event precedes it by just a couple of chapters? Are you familiar with this? Let's read, yeah. Exactly, absolutely. And why did that happen? Because of this famous, yeah. exactly, yeah, Moses was mad. He was definitely angry. He was angry. And he was angry because of a sin rebellion of the nation of Israel. Okay, so remember the timeline. Children of Israel are in the land of Egypt. God comes to them. Well, he, remember, he promised all the, way to, all the way back in the days of Abraham that Abraham would have many descendants. They would go into a nation not theirs. They would be enslaved in that nation for how long? Or, yeah, that's, that's right. In the fourth generation, then, they are to come out. God, right on time, if you read Exodus chapter 6 and 12, God says to the day that he made that promise, uh, he keeps that promise. The children of Israel come out right on time. And it is right after a series of famous 10 plagues that God levels upon the nation of Egypt in order to humiliate the pantheon of Egypt and to bring the children of Israel out. They, of course, then flee through the wilderness. They are trapped, pinned in at the Red Sea, if you know the story. God miraculously splits the Red Sea, delivers the children of Israel, brings them to the base of a famous mountain, Mount Sinai. From Mount Sinai, God speaks, and he utters ten commandments. We call it the Decalogue. And we call it Decalogue, it's Greek, but it means the ten words. And it means, it's referring to the fact that they were audibly spoken from the mountain. What are the first two commandments? Okay, have no other gods before me. And then secondly, make no graven images. All right. So, the people, after hearing God speak, right? You remember this? After hearing God speak, the Ten Commandments, or the, the Decalogue, what happens? Well, the people freak out. They don't want God to speak anymore, and they beg Moses to be the mediator between them and God. So he says, hey, would you go to the top? You know, the people say to Moses, would you go to talk to God for us and just tell us what he says? Moses does so. He goes to the top of the mountain. He's up on top of the mountain for how long? Hmm, 40. Interesting. He's up on top 40 days, during which time he is receiving not only the rest of the Book of the Covenant, but also the plans that God has designed for the wilderness tabernacle. So he descends the mountain. Well, actually, right before he descends the mountain, God tells him to descend the mountain. He says, Moses, get down the mountain. Why? He says, because your people... <laughs> And so it just cracks me up every time. Right? It's kind of like when my son gets in trouble and I say to my wife, it's your son, not my son. You know what I'm saying? But it's like, uh, but the children of Israel are rebellious against God. And God says to Moses, get down and for your people are committing great idolatry. So uh, we, that's what Moses says. He comes down and what does he witness? He witnesses the fact that the children of Israel, the nation who just weeks before, all right, we're talking less, you know, 40 days, 40 days before. They swore an oath to be faithful to Yahweh and to follow the Ten Commandments. What are the first two commandments? Have no other gods before him. 
making of graven images. They broke both commandments. In making and fabricating a golden calf, falling down to this, um, we could even go further if you really want to analyze that passage because Moses shows up, asks Aaron about it. Aaron lies about it. So there's another one of the Ten Commandments broken. Um, if you read carefully what the uh, false worship involved, it says they ate, sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. And if, yeah, you know, my, as my old seminary prof used to say, they weren't playing croquet, if you know what I mean. You know? Um, so they are involved in Canaanite sexual rites to worship a false god made of a, you know, out of a false image. So, I mean, there's at least four different commandments that they violated out of the ten, and all of that was within the first 40 days. And so God descends, or uh, sends Moses down. You remember the story? He witnesses all this. What's Moses' reaction? Well, he casts down the ten commandments, the tablets. Now, um, what's fascinating about that, and we could get lost in this for a while, you know, was, was Moses destroying that was in other words was that a knee-jerk reaction on Moses's part or we could also suggest because there is a lot of symbolism in the ancient world about this um that when because what were the ten commandments it was they were two tablets well the tablets the ten commandments were on the tablets um and we could actually argue that the, it was probably two copies of the ten commandments I mean you know it's kind of split in hairs but the point is the way this typically worked when there was a treaty, they would make two copies of the treaty so that you would receive a copy and, you know, the, the underling and the overlord would both receive a copy. So that's probably what's going on there. Uh, you got your hand up? Yes, go ahead. Mm -hmm. It, a great question. It was after. Yeah, so so because the, the Ten Commandments, God utters in, in Exodus 20. And then God calls Moses to the top of the mountain. So he's there for 40 days. Then he comes back, and that's when he catches him in the middle of the idolatry, the, the sin with the golden calf. So... <laughs> Oh, they were all aware. Yeah, because God audibly, audibly spoke all the Ten Commandments from the mountain. And it says the nation at large was, I mean, they, they all freaked out and they wanted God to stop talking um, because they were fear, afraid. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's right. Right. Right, sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, and he's doing everything he can to run from God. And yet God is not going to let him do it, right? God has his own means of turning Jonah around. And yet though, and this is what we're going to see tonight, is, and it's a, it's, a, it's a question that is kind of remains unanswered in the book. God gets Jonah to physically turn around and he gets him to go to Nineveh, right? I mean, okay, we already read that. That was chapter three. But the, there is the question that surfaces the nature of, of you know, true nature of submission because he gets, God gets Jonah physically to go to Nineveh, but does his heart really change in the process? And, you know, and we debated that where it seems like, man, Jonah chapter two sure seems like he gets genuine repentance, but then by chapter four, right, he's com in complete opposite, you know, he's at odds with God. 
And he's actually accusing God of being unjust. But, but notice this irony, all right? God, Jonah accuses God of being unjust, and he's getting upset, but he quotes Exodus 34. Now again, let me finish that you know, kind of long rabbit trail. Moses, come, Moses comes down from the mountain. They're all in the middle of, of idolatry. God basically says, I'm going to wipe them out. Remember this? He says, I'm going to wipe out the whole children of Israel, and Moses, I'm going to start over with you. You're going to be my new Abraham. Well, how does jo- or excuse me, Moses respond to that? Chapter 33 of the book of Exodus, he prays a prayer of intercession. And he begs God to extend forgiveness to the nation of Israel, right? And then he Moses or uh, God says to Moses, "Okay, I'll forgive them, but I'm not, you know, I'm not going to go with them to the land of Canaan." And Moses pleads for the presence of God. He says, "No, no, no. I'm, he says we're not going to leave this mountain until you say, you know, you're coming with us." So notice the, again the contrast. I think it's fascinating. Moses, you know, Moses is pleading for the presence of God when Jonah did the opposite. He ran from the presence of God. And but while Moses is praying, he then asks. He makes a petition at the end of chapter thirty-three. He says, "Lord, let me see your glory." And God makes a promise. He says, okay, I will let you see my glory, but no man can see me and live. So I'm going to put you in the cleft of the rock, cover you with my hand. I'm going to pass by. And then you will see the hinder parts of my glory, he says. That's exactly what happens. And chapter 34 is then where the story picks up. And Moses goes to the top of the mountain, just like God says. He's put in the cleft of the rock. God passes by. And when this happens, God declares his name, his character. And it's a rather famous declaration of the characteristics of God. And that's in Exodus 34. Uh, Pick it up in verse 5. It says, The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children in the third and fourth generation. And so Moses made haste and bowed his head to the earth and worshipped. Now, this confession or declaration of God concerning his own characteristics becomes then a famous source list of God's characteristics. So much so, and we won't take the time to do this, but you can jot this down. I put there in your notes that this will be repeated throughout the Old Testament as a way to summarize the person of God, the characteristics of God, the attributes of God. It'll be used by Joel chapter 2, Numbers 14, Nehemiah 9, 2 Chronicles 30, Psalm 86, Psalm 103, Psalm 145, and Nahum chapter 1. And so the point is, this is a rather famous confession and, or list of the attributes of God that Jonah appeals to. But notice the irony of this. In its original context, this confession of Exodus 34 was the basis for the people's thank- thankfulness as Yahweh declared himself to be gracious, compassionate, slow to anger, and abounding in love because these divine attributes saved them from destruction. The children of Israel as an entity should have been destroyed in Exodus 32. But they weren't. Why? Because God is gracious and slow to anger and long-suffering and merciful in this list. Because God is this way, the nation of Israel exists in the days of Jonah. But notice the irony. Jonah incorporates the words of that very confession as an angry complaint. Rather than a thankfulness, you know, for God's being this way and the fact that he exists, He's a descendant of these wicked people that should have been destroyed in Exodus 32. The very fact that Jonah is alive is because of God's graciousness, slow to to anger, merciful, etc. And yet, instead of using that as a way of thanking God, he actually uses that confession very ironically. It's out of place. Shouldn't be doing that. I mean, it's, it's, it's a hypocritical way to quote that passage. But nonetheless, he uses it as an angry complaint that God could not be counted on to punish those who deserve it. Right? He says, I knew that you would forgive them. And he's upset over it. Why? Because he's like, man, God, I, could, I was counting on you to wipe them out. And you didn't. And, you know, but do you see the whole point? Yeah. I forget. Was Jonah aware at the time of the prophecy of the other Jews? Like, was he aware that God was going to destroy the Jews? Or was he just 
it is not conclusive. Well, it's not ironclad. I do think it's persuasive that, yes, he was aware of them. Yeah, right. And Sure. Well, now they're saved, but are you, you're still going to let them live and hurt them? Like maybe that's kind of where that shift occurs. Of sure. The, they're safe, but what if the justice did a bunch of people? Kind of that nationalism. Absolutely. And I think that is the root of the issue. Is that well, one of the the roots of the issue is that he it's it's that heady nationalism, as we put it earlier, is that he is a, I think genuinely afraid for the future of his own people. And but it and I'm going to capitalize on that in just a second. He that is leading him then to question the justice of God in this whole scenario. And so yes, all right, hang on to that. We're going to develop that thought because I think you're exactly right. Now notice this: after his tirade against God, where he ironically quotes the very passage that describes God's grace, which allows him to continue to exist, but then he's angry that God is giving that same grace to Israel's enemies, after that tirade, Jonah expresses, expresses his wish to die in chapter 4 and verse 3. Now, he, he, he does this in a similar cry to that of Elijah in 1 Kings 19 verse 4. Also, we could compare Moses, similar sort of outburst Moses has in Numbers chapter 11 verse 15. But here's the irony. While the prophets, Elijah and Moses, when they cried out for God to just take their life, while the cries between these guys might be similar, the causes behind them were drastically different. In other words, before I listen on the screen, what was it that made Moses or Elijah despair of their own life? Do you remember the context? Yes, well, that's a slightly different context, but you're, but you're right. In, in we, what we just alluded to in Exodus 33, Moses actually oper- offered up his own life in the place of the nation. It shows pretty depth, you know, a lot of deep compassion there, which we'll see Jonah completely, is completely absent in Jonah. But, yeah. Wasn't Jacob and Jacob's prophet trying to give his people and the people weren't listening? And Jacob was Exactly, exactly. Think through this just briefly. Elijah, when he utters that statement in 1 Kings 19, he is so discouraged. Why? Because of Israel's sin and rampant worship of Baal. Jonah, on the other hand, is upset that God has not punished a repentant Nineveh. Elijah suffered from persecution in 1 Kings 19, right? His, he was under threat of death and he flees for his life from Queen Jezebel. Jonah, on the other hand, suffers from unwanted success. Do you see the irony? Jonah was successful and didn't want it. Elijah was unsuccessful and he wanted it. But both of them end up with the same declaration. Oh, it's not, you know, it's it's not worth living anymore. And they want God to take their life. Jonah's anger was motivated by a narrow nationalism, which we referenced a second ago. And Jonah thought God's mercy was cheapened by his deliverance of Nineveh. Interesting comment, interesting thought. He was unable or better unwilling to reconcile his knowledge of who God is with who he thought he should be. Now, let me pause and think, you know, let's think on that one for just a second because we are all to one degree or another, we are all guilty of this because idolatry by definition is making a God, you know, fashioning a God after our own liking. And the danger of that is that when we, take what we believe, right, the knowledge of who God should be, really what we know of God, but we don't like reconciling that knowledge that we do have with who we think God should be. In other words, did Jonah have true theology according to verses 2 and 3 of that passage? Yeah, he quotes Exodus 34. He knows the attributes of God. He has correct theology, but what he's upset with is that he doesn't like the attributes of God, at least how they're applying to his particular situation. And that is true to a certain extent. That's true of all of us, that we at times are unwilling to reconcile our knowledge of who God is 
with who we want him to be or who we think he should be. And that's a dangerous way to live because we're no longer worshiping God. We are fabricating a God. Do you see the difference? If we just want, if we just worship a God that, you know, is to our liking, then it's not really God. We have to take God as he reveals himself. Like it or not, we have to let him speak for himself. And then we worship him as he is. Give me an example in modern culture of someone or some way that we manufacture. We think we're worshiping the God of the Bible, but we actually are manufacturing a false God. Can you give me an example? Yeah. Exactly. Do y'all catch that? I mean, it's a great example. The idea of toleration. All right. So we got to tolerate and they'd say, well, God's got to love. And then they redefine what love is. And they say love equals toleration. It means I can live however I want and you need to accept me. And that's what love is. But is that really biblical love? No. Love is, biblically, it is wanting the best for that person. And someone who is living self-destructively, for me to let that happen without you know, expressing concern or saying the words of God, that's not love. It's the opposite of love. You got a thought? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> the God of the prosperity gospel. You read that carefully and it's like, is that the God of the Bible? Mm, it's a lopsided view. They, they amplify certain characteristics of God, but while denying all these other characteristics of God or teachings in the scripture. Okay, excellent. That's a good example. But the reality is all of us to one degree or another, we can be guilty of this if we're not careful, is there's certain things about God that we're attracted to. And we're like, oh, you know, like in this case, Jonah, oh, I like God's justice, right? Bring it. Bring it, God. Just destroyed Nineveh. Mercy? Uh, not so you know, fond of that right now. But isn't that so opposite of what most people, are, I know most people like just the compassion part and don't want to think about the justice part. You know, like, yeah, because I think I would agree in our modern culture. Yeah. yeah. I think in our modern culture we see a swing the other way. Mm -hmm. Where people love the idea that God's kind of this cuddly grandpa in the sky, you know. And he just kind of winks and nods and smiles and pats us on the head. And he says, oh, you guys messed up. It's okay. It doesn't matter. You know, and, but they, they don't like the view. And this is why a lot of people will divide, totally wrong-minded, but they will say, well, you have the God of the Old Testament who is full of wrath and justice. And then you got the God of the New Testament and he doesn't have any wrath or justice. And we can do whatever we want and it doesn't matter. God loves us anyways. And it's like, whoa, you know, you're not viewing all the characteristics of God as he reveals himself. We're picking our favorites and elevating it. Yeah, and then we'll go back in. Go ahead and round. Sure. Hmm. That's true. That's good. Mm. Do you all catch that? It's a good observation because it, largely our view of God or what is what about God, what attribute in particular that we're drawn to and we like to maybe overemphasize to the neglect of others, that largely depends upon our circumstances. And even in this situation, right? Because Jonah wanted the loving, merciful, kind God back in chapter two when he was in the belly of a fish. And he when he needed deliverance, oh boy, 
He sure wanted God to be loving and merciful and kind and gracious and long-suffering and all that. But now that he wants God to destroy Nineveh, he resents the fact that God is what he is. So his, when his circumstance changes, so too his perspective. And absolutely. I mean, that's, that's a good observation. Yes. Mm, to, to a very large extent, yes, absolutely. And this is, it's, and, and like I said, we can all be guilty of this. this is, and it takes constant course correction because you could be correct, you know, in your theology, just like Jonah. He listed a true list of the attributes of God, but then he is misapplying or misappropriating that list or he's resenting that list. And so, and it takes a constant almost recalibration where we can be correct theologically, you know, in our, in our, as they sometimes say, we got it right in the head, but not in the heart, you know? Um, but we need to, it, it takes almost constant recalibration and course correction to be sure that I am not neglecting some attribute of God or ignoring that attribute of God because in my current situation, this attribute of God serves me better. Right. And that's I mean, that's and we got to be careful of that, because if we don't have a well-rounded, balanced view of God, then we will be guilty of creating a God in our in our own likeness and fabricating a God. And I mean, and, and really, you can pick any issue, you know, down through the ages when and, spe- and as kind of as you just mentioned, the idea of denominations and church splits and all this. Because every denomination and church split thinks they have God on their side. You know what I'm saying? They could be fighting to the death over some issue and both of them think that they have God on their side. And it's like, okay, you know, at the end of the day, they've, both sides are most likely guilty to one degree or another of fa- fabricating a God in their own likeness and emphasizing what it is they like about God, but don't want to talk about the other stuff. And and we can, and this is why just one quick thought on this and then I'll get off of it so we can keep moving. But this is why personally I teach the Bible expositionally. I also alternate and some people have picked on me for this. Um, And I have the microphone. So there, (laughs) but I alternate between a book, you know, book study, the old Testament, book study, the new Testament, book of old Testament, back to the new Testament. And why do I do that? Here's why. Paul says to the Ephesian elders in, F, you know, in Ephesus, Acts chapter 20, he says that, guys, you have to teach the whole counsel of God. And in other words, I teach expositionally, meaning I start a book of the Bible, I start in verse 1, and I go all the way through. Well, just I'll come back to that. Why? Because it will force me to get into topics that otherwise I don't want to get into. Um, because if I was to teach topically rather than expositionally, then it is a dangerous temptation to avoid things that should be talked about or to repeat things just because it's my hobby horse. And it's like the same, you know, and I, you know, there's pastors that do that, you know, I mean, it's like they have the same sermon every other Sunday, you know, and it's kind of like, well, how do I teach the whole counsel of God? I go through the Bible systematically. And so that we see God from all angles and we see everything. At least that's the, that's the hope. That's the goal. Not that I do it perfectly, but that's, that's why I teach expositionally. Sorry. Uh, Leave, I'll come back to you real quick. But what was your comment? Oh, oh, excellent. So let me pull that up. She's looking it up. The reference of the whole counsel of God comment. Acts 20, verse 27. Yep. And this is actually, it's actually Paul describing his own ministry to them in Ephesus. And then in, by implication, it's then his charge to them. He says, I have taught night and day, he says, for three years. And I have, he says, not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. I've told you everything from cover to cover, right? And so I, he's not guilty of being selective in his teaching. And so I think, again, that's why I'm sold on being an expositional, you know, pre- not that you can't do topical sermons. There's nothing wrong with that. But if that's your only steady diet, then there's a danger in it because I get aside to the topic. 
And it's somewhat arrogant, in my opinion, to think that I know best. I know the best topic for you guys to hear every single week, and I, it's up to me. Uh, really, I like taking my cues from God. Go through a book. And, we can, and that's why I alternate. New Testament, Old Testament, make sure we're covering all the bases so that I'm forced into things that might be a little uncomfortable for me and for you, but that's okay because <laughs> we're supposed to be listening to God, not Jeff Sauer. So, you have a, did you have a hand up? Yes, true. Exactly. Exactly. Thank you for that. Because if, yeah, if you guys are all messed up, it's only half my fault. <laughs> right, exactly. Because the other half is on you, right? Uh, no, that's exactly right. Because, you know, good exhibitional teaching needs to be followed up by the Berean strategy. Where you listen, you receive with all, you know, the word with all readiness of mind, but then you search the scriptures daily to see whether those things be so. That's excellent. Good. Excellent. Yeah. That's right. So that, that happens over and over again. Absolutely. Which really, I think, kind of ties in with what Marilyn said a minute ago. It's like, you know, if our own attitude will change oftentimes depending on our circumstances. Yeah. I hear you. And because we're all guilty of that. And, and, that's, and, and that's where we got to be careful making sure that we never interpret the Bible through our circumstances or experience. Rather, it must be the reverse. We must exp you know, interpret our experience and circumstances through the Bible. Because if we get that backwards, if we get the cart before the horse, boy, we're in trouble. <laughs> or we can quickly get off in the weeds. Exactly. Exactly. All right. So let me notice, let's, let's contemplate this for just a second. What is really wrong with Jonah in this passage? You know, when we think about his anger, what is the source of it? And let me give you a couple quotes here and some consideration, and then I'd like to hear your feedback. But one particular commentator by the name of Baldwin says this, Jonah was furious because he could not come to terms with the character of God, whose message he carried. He did not think Nineveh should enjoy the same benefits that he himself did. The prophet considers God's forbearance of Nineveh a weakness. And I think that's an interesting comment that, you know, he wanted God's mercy, but then when he didn't want to show God's mercy and he considered God's forbearance of Nineveh a weakness. So, what does God do? In verses 5 to 11, all right, now st stick with me now, because then, and we'll, we'll see what God does, and we'll come back and we'll continue this discussion. But after Jonah objects to God, God offers an object lesson to Jonah. So what God does is he fabricates an object lesson to expose the ridiculousness of Jonah's anger. Now, obviously, God is the one in control because it says in verse 6, 7, and 8, it uses that same verb that we've mentioned several times. It says it three times in a row, that God prepares a gourd, then he prepares a worm to destroy the gourd, and then he prepares a, uh, a wind, a vehement east wind, to beat down upon Jonah. So let's walk through this passage quick and, then, and see what God is trying to key in on here. As we continue our discussion. So first, God causes a gourd to grow, providing shade for Jonah against the hot ancient Near Eastern sun. One scholar pointed out that in other places in the Old Testament, God's grace is compared to shade. We won't go for, for sake of time, we won't go to those passages, but jot them down. Psalm 121.5, uh, Isaiah 4, verse 6, Isaiah 25.4, as well as an allusion in, in Isaiah 32.2, which is that one's probably a messianic prophecy, by the way, Isaiah 32, but where in those passages, God describes his grace, his favor, his protection to that of shade. It's like shade. It offers protection. It offers relief, and it's a benefit. So again, what's fascinating is that though God offers the shade, 
Then God next strategically appoints a worm to destroy the gourd and the shade that it provides uh, for Jonah. Secondly, however, not only does he destroy the gourd, but it says that he causes Jonah to experience the heat of the sun once again, as well as a vehement east wind, which many scholars talk about this, and, and we won't you know, belabor the point, but it's kind of fascinating if you do a little research on this. It's probably, in that area of the world, it's probably what is referred to as the Sirocco wind, which it comes, and when it comes, there is a drastic, it's actually often accompanied with a sandstorm, and it sucks whatever little moisture is in the air, it sucks it out, um, and it can cause a temperature spike of somewhere between 16 to 22 degrees, just almost instantaneously. It's like a hot oven blowing. And what is also an interesting tidbit of, of information that at least, you know, worthy of some consideration, and we talked about this before, but whether or not Jonah's, you know, what were the after effects of Jonah being in the belly of the fish? We don't know. The Bible doesn't say. But were there after effects, such as, as we talked about, some of the permanent permanent disfigurement, possibly? Um, what about maybe the skin? Actually, as we talked about before, if we look at James Bartley and some of the, those examples, where someone's skin is bleached white, uh, it's sensitive. In other words, when you are in those conditions, you would be that much more sensitive to heat and sunlight. And so the point is, the text declares that this was so miserable that Jonah actually fainted, it says, that he was near uh, losing consciousness. And once again, he expresses his desire to die in verse 8. This discomfort that God created for Jonah exposed Jonah's anger. In, chapter, in, in fact, in chapter 4 and verse 3, it's fascinating to note that Jonah is angry because God spared Nineveh. But in chapter 4, verse 8, he is angry because God destroyed the plant. The point of the object lesson is simple. God is trying to recreate a miniature microcosm of what he did for Nineveh. All right, think through this. What is the point of the gourd episode? God is trying to recreate a miniature microcosm of what he did for Nineveh. In other words, think of it this way. God did to Jonah what Jonah wanted God to do to Nineveh. First, God delivers Jonah with the shade, only to then destroy the shade and bring <clears throat> evil upon Jonah. In other words, God gave him a small taste of his own medicine. Because what does Jonah want God to do? To destroy Nineveh. He wants Nineveh to suffer. So God causes Jonah to suffer. He gives him a little taste of what he wants Nineveh to experience. And he's, you know, the whole point is God's trying to expose the root of his anger. Now, we won't get lost in this because I try not to overanalyze and totally bore you to death, but I think it's kind of fascinating. But there's a lot of subtleties in the Hebrew language in this passage that kind of help highlight some of these big ideas. Um, and again, we won't belabor the point, but in verse 6, when it says that he caused a shadow to come over his head in order to deliver him from his grief, the, the term shadow and deliver are actually similar roots in Hebrew, as well as the word grief that is in verse 6. It's the same word that's translated as evil earlier in chapter 3 and chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Also, the verb smote in verse 7 is the same word as beat down in verse 8. So the sun was beating down upon him. And... Again, don't forget the word play that heat and anger are the same word in Hebrew. And so the fact that he's experiencing heat and then he's angry as a result of it is, it's again, it's, a, it's kind of, it's supposed to make you giggle a little bit if you're reading it in Hebrew. Is you're like, you know what, he's actually getting hotter than the sun <laughs> that's actually scorching him. But the whole point of those subtleties, the word plays are beautiful and we won't take the time to overanalyze necessarily. But the word plays are beautiful to do what? To show you what God is doing. The point of the object lesson is to give Jonah a taste of his own medicine and to get him to experience the sort of discomfort and suffering that he wants Nineveh to experience. In other words, he begs God for personal deliverance from this suffering. And he expects God to give it to him. But he resents when the Ninevites beg God. For deliverance and God gives it to them. 
Do you see the point? Is God is trying to show how inconsistent and hypocritical Jonah is being here. So verses three and eight parallel each other with this phrase. It is better for me to die than to live, Jonah says. In verse three, Jonah is questioning God's right to deliver. Yet in verse eight, he's questioning God's right to destroy. It's like he can't make up his mind. (laughs) He's just upset, right? Whether God's delivering Nineveh or destroying the gourd, either way, he's just upset. Both times, what does God do? And, and let me pause and make just a point of this, and I won't belabor this, but this really struck me one of, for one of the first times when uh, several years back we were working through the book of Genesis. And whenever we see God approach Adam and Eve, and then he does the same thing with Cain in chapter 4, it's the same thing that God does here to Jonah. In other words, God approaches gently with questions. And you probably heard this before, but it's often, it, it's, it's a helpful proverb, and I've used it many times in my own life. Um, but accusations harden the will, while questions prick the conscience. Do you see the difference? If I'm in a counseling situation, or if I am working through an issue with somebody, or helping somebody through something, It never helps to point the finger and to accuse someone. Because when you point the finger and you come at somebody aggressively, typically what happens? Exactly. They they stretch stretch out the neck and bow the neck and stick out the chest and they're they're ready for a fight. And yet Proverbs 15.1 says a, a soft answer turns away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. And when you're coming to confront somebody and they are in the wrong and you're trying to help them see that they're in the wrong, does it help to just come and pound them or as they used to say, hit them upside the head with a Bible, right? And say, and just accuse them of every sin under the the sun and just point out all their faults. Now, ultimately, do you want them to see their faults? Yes, that's the whole point of this. You do want them to wake up and see their own faults. But how do you do that? Well, there's an effective way and an ineffective way. The ineffective way is to come in with guns blazing and basically just start a fight. Or you could do what God does. And he comes so graciously and patiently and he asks questions. And he, it's, in other words, he uses the Socratic method. But Socrates didn't invent it. God did. <laughs> but what's the Socratic method? You, remember that? you ask leading questions. Why? to try and actually teach. You're actually teaching even though you're asking questions. And it's fascinating. You ever studied carefully the teachings of Jesus, particularly when people ask him questions? You ever notice this? How often he responds with a question? Jesus was like the ultimate master of the Socratic method, the asking a leading and penetrating question to get you to pause, to think, to become maybe a little bit introspective. Hopefully, the goal is that he's leading you to a conclusion, right? One of my favorite examples of that, the Pharisees and Sadducees come and they confront Jesus. Remember this, Matthew 22? Well, end of 21. And they are, they're actually trying to start a fight. And they're trying to discredit Jesus in front of the masses. Remember this? So Jesus so masterfully and beautifully dodges that by, number one, telling a parable. Third, per, you know, third person, you know, no, it's a parable. It disarms him right away. He's not accusing him. He's not pointing the finger. Rather, he tells a parable, and it's the parable of the vineyard owner. Remember this? And he turns it over to these uh, tenants that are working the vineyard. And then when it's time for him to receive the fruit of the vineyard, remember this, he sends servants, and they reject the servants, and then sends more, and they kill the servants, and then he sends the son, and they kill the son. And then, before applying the parable, Jesus pauses and he asks them a question. He says, what do you think should happen to those tenants? What should the Lord of the vineyard do? You remember this? And what's their answer? (laughs) Christ, oh, the Lord of the vineyard should kill those wicked men and give it over to a different, you know, give it over to different tenants. And Jesus says, yep, you're exactly right. And then he applies it and they condemn themselves. Yeah, exactly. And then they get to the end of that passage and they said, oh, I think he's talking about us. 
right? And, <laughs> and it's like, yeah, yeah, you figured that out now. Um, you know, another example, do you remember Nathan the prophet who comes before David? After David had sinned with Bathsheba, and almost a year later, David has not been right with God for almost a year, and Nathan is trying to expose David. But he, rather than come in and just point a finger and get, you know, and attack David with an accusation, what's he do? He tells a story. So there's this guy, yeah, that takes the, the rich guy and the poor guy. The poor guy's got this little lamb. The rich guy's got guests coming in town, takes the lamb of the poor guy and, you know, offers it up for these guests. And David says, what? And he says, yeah. You know? <laughs> and Nathan's setting him up just beautifully. And, and Nathan's like, what do you think should happen to this guy? And, Nathan, and, and David says, oh, he should pay back fourfold and die for it. And then, you know, the famous turn of phrase, what does Nathan say? Thou art the man, right? You are he. You, you want to know the guilty party? Just look in the mirror, you know? And, and it just disarms David. David has nothing to say because he just condemned himself. And, but that's the whole point. And, that, and God is so good at that. And we need to get better at that. Um, and it, it really is in a very effective way um, to, to approach people. And so I just point that out. And, you know, I won't belabor the point, but it is fascinating. And it's a very practical point to be made. Yeah. Sure. No, that's a good question. So, so is there a time and place for an out, outright rebuke? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, because, you know, and that's, let's, I'm glad you bring it up because let's, let's get this full orb because Jesus does, there are there times even in his ministry where he just, I mean, there's no leading questions. There's no more, you know, feeling out the waters. I mean, it's just straight to the point. Yeah. That's Matthew 23. That's the woes against the, you know, five, the scribes and Pharisees. Yeah. Woe unto you. And he pulls no punches, you know? Um, so here's the question. When do we know the difference? You got a point. You got a, you got an answer to this. I think there's there's a uh, there's a couple of good verses that will answer this for us. But what's your thought? <clears throat> All right. So number one, they've already been informed of the truth, and they are rebelliously refusing to see it. What were you going to say? Just like Jonah, we can see the same thing today. All these guys off the BLM thing, they pick one thing and they focus on that so intently that they seem to not even care of all the injustice that goes on. But they're so focused on that one thing that they can't see anything else. And they wind up doing just like Jonah, mm -hmm. taking a totally, and I think when a person or a group gets like that, Sure. Yeah, the Socratic method doesn't work. <laughs> All right. Okay, good. We're going to come back to that. What were you going to say? Uh, <clears throat> Right. Absolutely. Hey, well, there you go. Yeah, <laughs> it's a step in the right direction. <laughs> Good. Excellent. Marilyn. Good. 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 So in other words, there's a progression and it kind of fits with what Simone just said where 
you know, by the time you actually have to outright rebuke, okay, hopefully that's not the first step you took. In other words, there is a progression of approaching someone with a more gentle spirit and, and then seeing, okay, are they informed? Maybe they're just ignorant. Well, okay. And you, and you have to have a conversation with them. They're not ignorant. They're just rebellious, right? And so you try again. Well, then that doesn't work. And so, because when we see Jesus outright rebuke these guys, I mean, he has given them three and a half years, you know, of teaching. And so he does approach them differently at the end than he did at the beginning, right? So good. So there's a progression. Um, let me throw a verse in here because I think it's helpful. In 1 Thessalonians 5, Paul talks about how the church is to be in operation here. And it's actually very similar um, to... Uh, Marilyn, what you just said, I mean, so it's, it's probably alluding, actually, to that church discipline process. But in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 11, he says, let me just read a few verses here. He says, Wherefore, comfort one another together, and, or comfort yourselves together, and edify one another, even as you also do. And we, we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you, and are over you in the Lord, and admonish you, and esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake, and be at peace among yourselves. Now we exhort you, brethren... Warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, and be patient toward all of them. And that is just like such the perfect pastor verse, you know, to tell a pastor how to be a pastor. And is because at the end of the day, and Adam, I'm glad you brought it up, because are there, is there a time where you have to outright rebuke? Absolutely. Do you have to be harsh sometimes? Yes. Um, when? According to this verse, it's when someone is unruly. In other words, to use the words of Simone, they know what's right and they are rebellious against it. But what if they're feeble-minded? What if they're not rebellious? They're, they're just weak. You know what I'm saying? They're, they're, they're giving in, they're falling, they're faltering, they're doubting, they're, you know, they got these nagging questions. Do I come at them, guns loaded and gun, you know, guns blazing? No, no, he says, don't do that to them. Rather, comfort those feeble-minded and support the weak. But whether they're weak, feeble-minded, or unruly, it's going to need, you're going to need patience for all of those scenarios. <laughs> and, but does that, does that answer your question? You got a follow-up thought on that? Okay, all right. Um, but that's good. That's an excellent question because it helps round out our discussion. Yeah. Sure. So kind of going back to the idea of what's your relationship with them? Yeah, good. Excellent. Amen. Well, that's practical, isn't that? That's a practical little discussion right there. Praise the Lord. And boy, I could tell you stories. I won't, but... I got, I don't know how many hundreds of hours of counseling experience, and it's, it's amazing, the difference, you know, and, and because, and Proverbs, boy, I'm telling you, Proverbs is the book to understand for counseling, but because you have in there, you have the wise man, you have the foolish man, you have the simpleton, and you have the scoffer, and depending on where in that category, you know, those categories, your person falls into, you treat them differently, and it's, it's 1 Thessalonians 5, you know, the unruly, rebuke them. And I mean, and, and normally, you know, and again, first attempt, I'm trying to just get to know somebody in a counseling situation, talk through some things with them, ask them questions, you know, doing the Socratic thing, kind of, you know, leading them along. But there's been at least one time, I mean, I thought it was going to be a wrestling match uh, that broke out in a counseling situation. And I did. I got my, my daddy voice, he, <laughs> he later called it, <laughs> where I, I mean, I, I had to shout the guy down. And uh, I just about threw him out of my office, like physically took hold of him. Like he about, he lost control and he was about to attack his wife and I just about killed the guy. So, <laughs> and, but are there times where we need to take some very drastic measures? Yeah. You know, there, and does God have to do that? Yeah, absolutely. But I think that's part of wisdom is how do we discern the, you know, the, the mindset of that individual and how we approach them in that given scenario. And so, whew, that's the book of Proverbs sort of stuff. No, he just says, you need that action on your family all the time. And then I go home and have to think about those questions you asked them. Yeah, they were. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, that's encouraging. It doesn't totally fall on deaf ears. Oh, no. <laughs> Praise the Lord. All right. 
All right, so let's wrap up a few more thoughts on this idea of God's object lesson to Jonah. Notice this. First of all, recognize God is so good in his gentle approach to Jonah. In fact, God continued to demonstrate that same patience toward Jonah that Jonah refused to demonstrate towards Nineveh. So God's leading question in verses 4 and 9 can be rephrased as follows. When God says, basically, he says, doest thou well to be angry? Or are, are you really right in this? You could rephrase it as follows. God's really asking Jonah, what right do you have to demand God show favor toward you, but not toward someone else? You see, that's really what God is asking. But rather than accusing, do you see how gently he approaches Jonah? He says, are you right to be angry? And it's, it's really a thought-provoking question that makes Jonah, uh, well, he's, and again, we don't see the end of this conversation. That's why it's so anticlimactic is, you know, the book ends and Jonah doesn't give a second answer. You know, I mean, it's, well, a third answer because he does, God asked him, remember the first question in verse four, and there is no recorded answer. Jonah just goes out to the east side of the city and he waits, probably wait, waiting and hoping for judgment to ultimately fall on the city. But then God does the whole gourd thing and then he comes with another question. He says in verse 9, he asks the same question a second time. Are you, do you well to be angry for the gourd? But then notice Jonah's response. He says, I do well to be angry, even unto death. You know, so obviously the Socratic method is not working right now. <laughs> you know, uh, Jonah is not being led to the proper conclusion, at least at this point, is he is angry and he's sticking to it, <laughs> uh, if we could put it that way. But I've got to point out this irony because I, I think it's so profound. But recall that Jonah and Hosea are contemporaries. Don't forget that. And what's fascinating is that God's loving kindness and his willingness to forgive form the heartbeat of, of Hosea's message. If you were to go and read the book of Hosea, then you would discover that the basic heartbeat of the book is all about God's love and his gracious forgiveness, God's patience. And how Israel needed God's patient mercy just as much, if not more so, than Nineveh did. And yet, do you see the point? Jonah totally missed the boat, if I can put it that way. Uh, he missed the boat when it came to Hosea's message. He totally missed it. And, but Hosea, is, it's the whole point. Because remember the, the story behind Hosea? And again, just, just jot those references down. I don't know if we have quite time to go through them all. But Hosea 3, let me just read that one real quick. It's, it's quick. Hosea 3, verses 1 to 5. Let me just read this to you. Because <clears throat> this is after God tells Hosea to go marry Gomer. Gomer's a prostitute who leaves Hosea more than once. He, she has multiple children uh, with other men other than Hosea. And then God comes to Hosea with these heart-wrenching words. Like, I mean, whew, try to imagine being Hosea. And God says in Hosea 3, verse 1, Then said the Lord unto me, Go yet, or go again, again. Interesting word. Love a woman beloved of her friend, yet an adulteress, according to the love of the Lord toward the children of Israel who look to other gods and love flagons of wine, or some translations would say ragazin cakes, and they were used in false worship. But the point is, in verse 2, Hosea obeys God. And he actually goes, if you recall the story, and he purchases his wife from the slave market because she has so prostituted herself that she has lost her own freedom. And she ended up being sold as a slave and... Hosea purchases her off of the slave market and brings her home. And he begins to love her yet again. And God says, do that. Why? Because, God says, verse 1, that's the way I love my people Israel. That every time they run away from me to these foreign gods, God says, I still love them. And I go back after them. And when you think about the depth of God's love, as illustrated in the life and marriage of Hosea, then it is incredibly ironic that Jonah missed it. That the bottom line message of Hosea is God's limitless, exhaust, you know, <clears throat> inexhaustible love for Israel. And yet, it's that very inexhaustible love that Jonah 
resents about God when it comes to Nineveh. Does that make sense? It's pretty dramatic. Now, this is what I'd like to do for the next few moments is I, I, I'm going to list through these um, and then we'll, I'd like to hear some of your feedback and, so, and, and I'd like to hear your thoughts. But practically speaking, I want to try and tie together some of the, the big themes that we have seen thus far in the book. And what I want us to recognize is, you know, and, and practically consider for the last few moments here this evening, are, are these five big ideas. Number one, I want to just consider, just give a minute to considering the nature of true submission to God. Secondly, I want to talk about how we ought to recognize the absolute sovereignty of God. That's a big theme in the book. Number three, the root of anger, despair, and even the suicidal tendencies that Jonah exhibits from chapter one and then again here in chapter four. And we started that discussion all the way back on, uh, was it Tuesday night when we were in chapter one? Number four, I want to talk about detecting personal inconsistencies. And then number five, I want to talk about discovering uh, why God uses weak vessels like Jonah. Why God insisted on using Jonah when Jonah did everything to resist God. God insisted on using him. And why is that? Why does God insist on using weak vessels? And we cannot exhaust all these five ideas. In fact, much of our discussion thus far in the, the last four evenings, we have already touched upon nearly every one of these ideas. And so I, I'm, again, I'm really proud of you guys. You're tracking along really well. And a lot of our discussions, you got to this point even before uh, I did in the teaching process. So it's excellent. You guys are really tracking along really well. Well, let's consider these things because I think they're, they're really the practical heartbeat to the book of Jonah. So, first of all, let's consider the nature of true submission. This chapter, chapter 4, reveals that we can be outwardly obedient to God without being genuinely submissive to God. Jonah, in other words, did preach to Nineveh like God told him to, yet at his core, Jonah was still at odds with God. In other words, and, and we've already touched upon this, so I don't need to beat it to death, but I think this is one of the big practical points of the book of Jonah, is that the book of Jonah does, I believe, draw a distinction between obedience and submission, where, or in other words, outward conformity versus inward submission, that I can do outwardly what God says or what is expected of me while internally resenting it the whole time. And when someone lives that way, it's, it's really a miserable way to live. You know what I'm saying? Uh, and, and, we, and I won't beat this to death. We already mentioned it. And I think last night even we dwelt upon this idea. But there's a lot of believers that I know that are miserable Christians. And it's really sad. Because the Christian life is the most joy-filled, fun existence that you could ever have. I mean, wow. praise the Lord. It's a wonderful thing to be alive. It's a, it's a better thing to be a Christian and be alive. And it's a better thing to be a Christian and be dead because you know, <laughs> then we go to the next life, right? So, I mean, it just gets better from here, you know? And the point is, it's, it's a really a sad thing to me. It grieves my heart when I meet a Christian who is absolutely miserable. Um, I can understand an unbeliever being miserable. They deserve to be miserable. They should be miserable. You know what I'm saying? Like, they don't understand life. They don't get things, right? They, they have a uh, struggle with guilt and shame and despair. Like, I totally get why an unbeliever is unhappy. I, I understand that. But for a Christian to be unhappy? Now, I'm not saying you can't have moments of frustration, times where you have to process a trauma in your life. Absolutely, that, that takes time. But to live in a perpetual state of grumpiness as a believer, um, it's a sad thing. And the reality is, I, there, I think just by experience, we can all see that and say that we've observed it. But I think by, by watching the book of Jonah, we can demonstrate it in his life that there is a difference between outward obedience and conformity and inward submission. And when we have no spirit of submission in our hearts, we'll never have joy. And because we're always bucking the system, the rules, the, the boss, the authority, whoever it is humanly in our life or ultimately against God. And we hold a grudge against God. And sadly, that's where Jonah is at the end of the book, is he's holding a grudge against God. And it has robbed him of any sort of joy. Rather, he is saturated with anger. And he's really, he's the loser in this situation. And God's trying to get him to see that his anger isn't right. He says, doest thou well to be angry? Are you really in the right here, Jonah? Think through this. 
And he's trying to get Jonah to rectify in his thinking where he has gone awry. So I think, number one, practical point to be made, there is a difference between outward conformity or outward obedience and inward submission. And inward submission is necessary for genuine joy in the Christian life. But secondly, I want you to think of this practical point, the sovereignty of God. Now, we also dwelt on this one last night, so I don't need to beat this one to death, but we talked about the sovereign hand of God in the history of Assyria and how God, the manifold wisdom of God as he unfolds the plan of redemption. And he is, you know, again, we, we use the phrase, God plays chess, not checkers. Right? He's thinking way ahead, and God is so awesome in how he orchestrates history. And the better you understand your Bible and history, the better you can see the sovereign hand of God throughout it. And it's to me, it's one of the more stunning things about the book of Jonah. It's breathtaking when you consider all the different pieces at play that God uh, had on the chessboard, if you will, to put everything in the right perspective and in the right position in order for God to keep all of his promises, to maintain his consistent character, and you know to keep all of his threats. I mean, wow, God pulled it all off so beautifully. But one of the things, and we camped on this last night, so again, we don't have to beat it to death, but the book of Jonah teaches a similar lesson that is communicated in the book of Job, for instance, namely this, that Yahweh is not bound by anyone's opinion of how he should act or what he must do to remain just, merciful, or compassionate. God's freedom and sovereignty over all things is as absolute as it is inscrutable. And that idea, profound idea, we camped on last night, and we used this illustration in Matthew 20, the laborers in the vineyard, remember that? The idea that you know those, those guys that all got paid the same for working various amounts of hours in the day, and at the end of the day, they were upset about it. The guys who worked the longest were upset about it. And the answer that the Lord of the vineyard has is basically, it's my vineyard, it's not your vineyard. I can do what I want. It's my money, it's my vineyard. And the point is, it's, it's kind of a bit of a slap in the face, is whenever we think, God, you're being unjust. You didn't treat me fairly. I think you should have done this or this. I think I should have had a better job. I think I should have, I should have a bigger house. I should have a nicer car. I shouldn't have these health issues. I think, you know, fill in the blank, whatever it is. But we accuse God of injustice. And at the end of the day, if we don't square with this reality, that God's sovereign. He, God's God, I'm not. And if, if I can't square with that, then I, I will never be able to, you know, live a meaningful, productive Christian life because I'm just upset at every turn. Yeah, you got a thought? And then we'll go back. It reminds oh. me of something I heard when I was in a class this year. I was talking about my passion for the Lord. And one thing that stared me was the Lord of Amen. And I was like, oh, man, that's what I want to do. Amen. That's good. Only thing that's fair is for me to go to hell. Like, that's the only thing that's actually fair is for you to go to hell. So if you really want to go there, yeah, right, exactly. Do you really want fair? Yeah, right. <laughs> Amen. No, that's an excellent point. And it's really the flip side of, Dave, what you were mentioning earlier, kind of the prosperity gospel, you know, which, which again, this is one of those things that somebody who is deep into that prosperity gospel, and I had a guy uh, years back, I just moved here, and he didn't even come to this church, but he found me, and he came into my office, and he was just bawling his eyes out, and he, and he was telling me this really long, dramatic story of his life. And he, believed, and he believed God betrayed him. Why? Because he believed in the prosperity gospel. And he says, I hit all the right buttons. I did this, 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 and I lost my house. God is not real. That's what he told me. And Exactly. Exactly. That's right. And I mean, but the point is he had a warped view of God, which led to misery in his life because he couldn't reconcile, you know, what his circumstance was with what he, who he thought God should be. And boy, that, I'm telling you, that false view of God will ruin your life and any false view of God. I mean, but that, oh, it's so dangerous. You were going to say something. You had a hand up? I was just going to say that I think a lot of the Christian life talk about as a Christian, uh, start off doing the right thing, we don't necessarily want to, but we do because we want to try. That if we don't progress to the point where we really trust that God is good and, and His way is the right way, then we're going to stay in, in that, uh, what, what was, uh, not submission, but uh, just that outward conformity. Outward conformity. Hmm. If we stay there, we're going to get to where 
we just trust God that what he's doing is right and the end will be right and let go and let him do it if we don't ever get there, then we're going to be unhappy. But that, God takes us where we're at mm -hmm. and, he, and he works on us and works on us and works on us until we good. finally get there and we say, you know what? Okay, God, you're right. I'm on it. Amen. Amen. And that's really what God's looking for. Is, you know, and it's a Christian life. That's right. And I think, can't you even see that in his question to Jonah? He says, are you right, Jonah? Do you really think that I'm in the wrong and you're in the right? Because I did for a while. Exactly. And that's, that's what Jonah says. Yes, he says, I am right to be angry. And God says, you know, think about this. You know, and he's trying to get Jonah to switch the perspective and say, no, Jonah, can you possibly admit that you're in the wrong and God is the righteous one? At least he's given the information or the challenge right. to get from there. Excellent. Good. Yes, sir. So the more I look at this story, the, the, the point of the story really saves the universe from destruction? Or <laughs> is it God seeing a problem in the outdoors problems sure. that needs to be fixed? Yeah. And, uh, I think That's good. I read uh, Jonah was high up in Israel and he kind of contributed to the deterioration of Sure. God sure. Said, okay, my prophet, you're getting more proud of yourself than you deserve. I have a job for you. That's good. That's good. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. Is the book of Jonah less about saving Nineveh and more about saving Jonah? <laughs> yeah. That's good. That's good. Adam. It's hmm. good. And yes, I, I, I like that because I think, again, the book of Jonah, whoever wrote it, I think it's probably best to say Jonah wrote it. I mean, it makes the most sense. But, but it seems to be, recall our introduction, it was, it's written in Hebrew. So it was written to a Hebrew audience. And I think... Exactly what Adam's trying to point out is we need to read the, the book with that in the back of our mind. Is that, okay, who is hearing this story for the first time? Who is it that God wants to know this story? Obviously Jonah, obviously Nineveh, but who then is reading the book when Jonah composes it? And, you know, I think he's taking it back to his nation, Israel. Exactly. And Israel needs to read the book of Jonah. And they need to start being confronted with these ideas that they are a wicked nation that is not responding to God. And you have a pagan Ninevite nation that did respond to God. So God bestows grace. But it's also his bestowal of grace on Nineveh is simultaneously a warning upon Israel. And he's saying, hey, if you guys don't repent, you know, then you're going to get it. And ironically, you're going to get it. From Assyria, right? I mean, from these guys that did repent. They're going to be the instrument of judgment upon Israel. So, I mean, again, try to read the book from that. That's a good perspective to have. Read the book from the perspective of that first Israeli audience and how you would be reading this and what would be going through your mind. I'm going to come back to that at the end because I want to, I'll, I'll tie that together with another thought, but that's excellent. Was there another hand over here? Yeah. <clears throat> That's right. That's good. And that's, and I like the whole idea of the object lesson because you got to sit and stew on it for a little bit. And there's a lot of things that come out of it. <laughs> that's good. <clears throat> Excellent. Any other thoughts on that? I'm having fun. You guys having fun? Boy, it's a good time. All right. Yes. Yeah. 
still wants to like still be able to do like something like that, but it still has a dream associated with it. Sure. And I just think it's interesting how the way that the Bible is written, especially when you get into like ancient Hebrew and mm. stuff, how it really can speak so many different things to so many different people and just be offered to so many of the word. Amen. And how everyone in this room can get something from it simultaneously. And it's not necessarily wrong. It it meets us where we're at. Sure. And we all get entertainment from it. Yeah, amen. The the word of God is a is Quick and powerful, as Hebrews says. It's alive, and it does an amazing work in our lives. Absolutely. Amen. All right, so notice, right, let's let's jump back on this topic, because <clears throat> we had some really good discussion on this all the way back on Monday, Tuesday night, maybe, when we were in chapter one. <clears throat> and we talked about, remember when Jonah jumped over the boat? Well, thrown over the boat. Is we were saying, okay, was that a noble self-sacrifice? Or was it suicidal, and I think we use the word vindictiveness, against God? And, you know, I think the general consensus was it was a suicidal sort of attitude that he was exhibiting. So if that's the case, it's, it, it might have been the case in chapter 1, definitely present in chapter 4, because he twice says, I, yeah, kill me, I have no reason left to live. So if that is what Jonah's, you know, struggling with, what is at the root of this issue? All right, now let me, let me list this off and then I'd like to hear your feedback, all right? So first of all, make this observation. Anger is our natural response to a perceived injustice. It's not only that, but that's a good definition of anger. Anger is a natural response to a perceived injustice. We feel wronged in some way, shape, or form, and so we, we get angry. Now, Jonah had a misconception about God, and as we already mentioned, he was actually in this scene in chapter four, accusing God of being, in, un, you know, accusing God of injustice. He believed God had been unjust in dealing with Nineveh, and now believed God was being unjust toward him. Right? That's the whole idea: is he lost the gourd? And again, kind of being, you know, going back to Miss Kelly's comment, <coughs> is we have well, if you want fairness, go to hell, right? <laughs> <laughs> Pun intended. No, anyways. But the idea is that's that's what real fairness is. And so it's like, Jonah, you don't really don't want that. But he's accusing God of injustice. This reveals then both a lack of understanding toward God as well as a lack of trust in God. And, and that's the irony of it is he's a prophet of God, but <laughs> as you just mentioned, it's like, man, who's really needing salvation here in the book of Jonah, you know? Jonah has a lot of misconceptions about God that have brought him to a very dangerous place in his life, but his reaction in chapter 4 is exposing the fact that he really doesn't understand God's character, number one, and he doesn't trust in God's sovereignty and God's mercy and God's justice. He is doubting all of those things. He's questioning all of those things. By preaching to Nineveh, Jonah had actually become an unwilling accomplice to Israel's destruction. We've already talked about that, but God would use Assyria to be the instrument to destroy Israel. So he, Jonah, could not reconcile God's show of mercy toward Nineveh with his perceived understanding of God's justice. That's why I said all the way back on Monday night during the introduction that I, I genuinely believe that the book of Jonah functioned for the nation of Israel, the northern kingdom of Israel, the same way that the book of Habakkuk was supposed to function for the southern kingdom of Judah. In other words, God was answering the same question, but to different audiences in a different circumstance. But it's the same question. How can God be just in these given circumstances? And in Habakkuk's day, he couldn't understand how God was going to use Babylon to come in and destroy Judah. In uh, Jonah's day, he couldn't understand how God would uh, spare Nineveh only to allow them to come and destroy Israel. The, they, he couldn't reconcile these ideas. So because he couldn't reconcile it, get the practical point here, because he couldn't process this, his worldview was crumbling. He was losing perspective and he could not grasp God's character. Now, again, we spent a whole series developing this. It's called Practical Theology. It's up on our website. But that whole, the whole premise to that series is that the most important thing about us is our view of God. And if we have a false view of God, it will lead eventually in some way, given, given the right circumstances, it will lead to a crisis of faith. 
because at some point we won't be able to process and properly assess our life circumstances in light of who God is. And so ultimately, because of a trauma, we end up blaming God. And if you're not careful, you walk away from God. It's called apostasy. You got a thought? It looks like you got a hand up. Hmm. Right. Your human response, if you don't have that understanding of what it means to be in faith and God's will or for us, or a willingness to get there um, of what God really says about death, because from our human perspective, that's it. That's the end. Death is a big thing, and whatever else you want to pick. From mm-hmm. our human perspective, it's one thing, but when you get into God's word, Exactly. Trauma is going to happen. That we all have those, those relationships, those spiritual relationships that have the power to sway us when we're in the need of the moment. Excellent. No, <laughs> that's excellent. No, that's good. You got follow up, Rick? I, I, think, I think that it's inevitable we will go that way, except God always steps in. And Job, I think of Job, mm-hmm. he probably started off saying, oh yeah, God's okay, but after he got grilled by his buddies, he starts defending himself, and he starts setting himself up like, hey, you know, I'm going to go like a prince and talk to God about this. And That's God right. steps in. That's good. And he says, hey, you know, to him, he's always saying, I repent. I'm wrong. Amen. That's good. So the That's true good. believer in his journey, <clears throat> God's grace will come around and say, yeah, God's right. That's but excellent. There are places there when, when we don't. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, because it's a growth process, and we will fall flat on our face sometimes. But I like what you're mentioning because let me – let me. I'm getting there. I want to come back to this Job thing because Job is a – him and his wife are, are fascinating in their contrast because they evidence the two ways to deal with trauma. And so hang on to that. Let's get back to it. <clears throat> it's somewhere in these next couple of slides. Just trust me. But track with this thought real quick. <clears throat> One of the strengths of the Christian worldview is how it allows us to properly appraise all things. I'm out of time, but I wish I could go there. 1 Corinthians 2.15 talks about how uh, the Christian can judge all things, but is judged by no man. And the word, probably the better way to translate that is the word appraise. In other words, the Christian, if you know who you are, where you came from, why you're here, and where you're going, you have a Christian worldview. And you can answer that biblically. Now you, you stand... On the precipice, because you have the revelation of God, you stand high enough where you can see the lay of the land. You may not understand everything, but you can put things in their proper perspective because you know who you are, where you came from, why you're here, where you're going. But if you don't have the Christian worldview or you have you know, <clears throat> a misconception of the Christian worldview, then it, it leads to an inability to really appraise a situation. You, you don't understand true values. You don't understand uh, true outcomes. You can't process life. Ignorance or a perverted theology will lead to despair, despondency, and ultimately suicidal tendencies. The ultimate end of someone, and I, I can't tell you how many times I've heard this story or talked to people who are suicidal, and you go backwards in their story, and exactly what Mar- Marilyn just said, typically you can find some trauma. Why are they now suicidal today? Because last year, they lost a loved one. Last year, they got a disease. Last year, they went bankrupt. Some trauma, whatever it is, some trauma happened in their life. They can't process it. They blame God for it. And now here they are 
ready to take their own life. Do you see how important it is to be able to appraise all things? Process. How do I process life? The best way to do it is through the lens of Scripture and a biblical worldview. But the point is, if you can't do it, that's the root cause of where ultimately people get when they're suicidal. Jonah is unable to reconcile who God is with who he thinks God should be. So, now I'm to Jonah. Let's come back, or from Jonah to Job. Let's go back to this. <clears throat> when we experience trauma that we do not process properly, we often react by blaming God the way Job's wife did. Remember in Job chapter 2, verse 9, she says to Job, curse God and die. Now, again, I mean, I don't, we kind of beat up on her a lot, because, but think about it. She went through the trauma of all traumas, right? I mean, she goes from the wealthiest, you know, woman in, in the world, or at least in the East, it says, and then she goes to nothing. She loses her whole family, and then her husband, Job, has boils, and he seems to be on his deathbed. I mean, she goes from the height of heights to the lows of, lowest of low. But what's her response? When she goes through that sort of trauma, financial, familial, everything, what's her response? God's fault, so let's just blame God. And now, because there is no anchor point, because God is the problem, there's no reason to live anymore. Let's just die. That is, again, it's kind of an extreme story, but it illustrates the typical way, one of two ways you can process trauma. The second way, however, is the way Job processes trauma. Do you remember this? She says, curse God and die. What does Job say? Do you know this off the top of your head? <clears throat> exactly. Exactly. He says, if, if we receive good from the hand of the Lord, back to our prosperity gospel, if we receive good from the hand of the Lord, shouldn't we also receive the bad? Exactly. Earlier in chapter one, he says, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away, and then what? Blessed be the name of the Lord. Exactly. He, in other words, he has a high view of God's sovereignty, God's justice. He says, God's not wrong here. There must be a purpose. I don't understand it, but I'm going to trust him anyways. And it says, and through all this, Job did not sin with his mouth, it says, you know, at the end of chapter two. And, it, and it's a beautiful passage to illustrate the two ways that we handle trauma. We either blame God and want to die, or we trust God. And so I, I think it's important for us to recognize, you know, the, the difference there. Now, thoughts on that before we jump to the next one? I know I'm kind of running on, low on time, but we had some really good discussion on that, you know, back on Tuesday night. But any other thoughts on the suicidal tendency thing? Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of <clears throat> And it's because they don't have a proper worldview, and they don't know what's going on in their world, and they get that shut down, and they don't yeah. know where they stand anymore. And I feel sorry for them because yeah. I had started to feel that way before I caught myself to realize maybe it was not the hand of the Lord. And if you were here last night, I mean, you made this comment last night, and it's such a beautiful illustration of that principle. Did you all hear what Simone said? She said, right now, suicide rates are up um, because the American dream is dying. And the point is, our bank accounts are not real secure. Our economy is not looking that good. Um, our politics and our freedoms are in the rear view mirror <laughs> in some cases. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of things to be concerned about. And people who have a head on their shoulders and eyes in their head and are watching this, if, you know, they're, they're getting concerned. And, and if you are not a believer who, who knows what the Bible says about the end times, then you will be tempted to be thrown into a pit of despair and say, oh, it's over. My vacations, my paycheck, my job, it's, you know, my health, it's all under threat. There's no more reason to live. And you're going to pull a Job's wife. Curse God and die. And that's what's happening. They're, I mean, it's sad, but she's exactly right. This is exactly what's happening. But then you hear, hear Simone, she said, you know, I was tempted to think that way until what? And she made this comment last night. She realized, you know what? 
What does God say has to happen before Jesus comes back? The world's got to get rough. America's got to fall. A lot of things have to ha have to happen for the end time scenario to unfold. And it, it's, and I'm not saying it's going to be fun or comfortable by any means, but if we have the perspective to zoom out and say, hmm, maybe God's up to something good through all of this bad, then now that's what, that's the perspective. You see, you can appraise the situation, zoom out a little bit farther and say, you know what? There's not a reason to take my life. Rather, there's a reason to live because Jesus is coming back. And this is just the birth pains. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. That's true. That's true. The great apostasy. Yeah, the great falling away of the faith. And it's a sad thing, but it's part of the end time scenario. And we're going to see it. Don't let it surprise you. Because you remember what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5? He says, we are not like the foolish people who don't see this coming. He says, we know what's going to happen. We don't know all the details of when it's going to happen. But we know what God's up to. And he says, and that's what gets us through. And so, again, excellent illustration of how we can avoid those suicidal tendencies. Why? Because we can, with a Christian worldview, a man with a Bible in his hand can interpret the world. We can make sense of tragedy. We can make sense of everything in this world. And so we can cope. But someone who doesn't have a Bible or someone who's ignorant of that Bible, yeah, they got a lot of things to worry about. And, and it's a sad thing, but it's a, it's a, that's the real pandemic is biblical ignorance. You know, earlier you talked about that. I was probably in my church doing a message while we opened up four weeks ago to 50. Mm -hmm. And I thought, we better get there early to make sure we get in. I needn't even worry. Yeah, right. People aren't rushing back. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, don't get me started, man. I, yeah. <laughs> I got, yeah, I got a little tirade on that. But you're right, because when people see the death of the American dream, it's sad, but what is the top priority for even a lot of Christians? Is it to get back to church, to get back into fellowship, study the words, band together so we can endure these to hard times? No, I'm going to go. Yeah, right. It should be, right? It should be our reaction. But so many Christians, their, their real worry, well, I'm going to lose my vacation to Hawaii this year. Right. I mean, I've heard people say, man, I mean, I, what's that? Yeah, exactly. And it's sad. But that's what happens when we, just like Jonah, lose perspective. We're, yeah, I mean, it's just like, really? That's what is the most important thing in your life? But yeah. Well, I have to think about, especially for this generation, that people are in this position of support. Yeah. Exactly right. And that's what's so sad to me is how many Christians don't see that. Like they're worried about their job. They'll take risk to go to, to work. They'll take risk to do all these other things, but not to church. And why? Because they do not understand the necessity of community. And they think that they'll be fine as an island to themselves as a Christian. But we're not designed to live the Christian life that way. And it won't work. 
And at some point, just one degree or another, that's going to come back and bite them. But you can't tell them that. Or you try and tell them that, but it doesn't sink in. Like They, they just don't believe you. They'll, oh, no, I'm fine. I'll, I'll be all right. I can do the online church thing forever. Uh, you can't do that. Now, you know, do you? Do you yeah, exactly. I mean, it's like, it's sad. Now, I'm not saying you can't ever use online church. It's a great tool. It can be a great blessing, and it's been a help to this church. But can you be permanently part of an online assembly? It's not an assembly. By definition, it's not an assembly. And so it lacks the spirit of community, which so many people, they undervalue that. They devalue that. And it's really sad. <laughs> That's right. But they don't think because they're adult, they outgrow that. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's, we're human. We don't outgrow that. That's right. We need that. Exactly. All right. So I know I'm out of time, but I got to throw one more thought at you. Okay. So let me, here, just hang with me. Let me skip ahead a little bit um, to this maybe last slide. Okay. Last slide. So let me get here and just make a quick comment and then we're done because I know I'm out of time. But... What happens to Jonah? We don't know. I already said that. The, if he is the author of the book of Jonah, it may imply that he ultimately did repent before God and then told his own story. That's possible. We don't ultimately know. But what we do know, and this is where, and I can't go, I was wanting to take the time to go and read these passages, <clears throat> but, um, but we're out of time. But write these down. Because we don't know what happens to Jonah, but we do know what happens to Israel as a nation. But we also can, don't miss this connection, that Amos and Hosea are contemporary with Jonah. They predict what will happen to Israel, but then both of them simultaneously, and, and at least, you know, somebody this week that told me that they took the time this week to read through Amos and Hosea, greatly encourage you to do so, but you get to the end of those books, Amos 9, Hosea 14, both of them end in a similar way because both of the books are really more about judgment and like the sin of the nation and God is having to judge them because they're not listening. In other words, they're just like Nineveh was before they repented. And so they're not responding the way Nineveh did, you know, respond in repentance towards God. But at the end of both of their books, they both end on a positive note with a promise well, first, an appeal to repent. They just beg the audience, please repent. But then they both end with a promise of restoration. And here's the irony that, again, you, we just finished talking about, but Jonah missed it. Or at least it's not recorded in the book of Jonah. If he came to this awareness, it was later unrecorded in the Bible. Just what we just mentioned, how do we cope and how do we process the tragedy in our lives? We do it because we know the end game. We know ultimately, how, however bad it gets now, we know what's going to happen. God's going to, we're going to win. It's, it's, it's going to be okay. Was that true of Jonah? Actually, it was. Here's the sad thing. He could not process the idea that God would let Assyria destroy Israel. His own contemporaries, Amos and Hosea, promised that that would happen. But it's like he quit listening. He quit reading their prophecies. Get to the end. They say, yes, you will be judged. Israel's going to fall. But they both end the book with a solid promise. And they say, God's words through these guys, it's not going to end that way. Even though God will destroy Israel, that's not the end of the story. God will restore Israel. God's going to restore them. God's going to forgive them. God's going to bless them. And that's the message that we just finished preaching. That's the same message Amos and Hosea were preaching to their generation. Jonah was of their generation, and he missed the message. And Jonah's inability to cope and process why God would forgive Nineveh and then let Nineveh later destroy Israel, that, you know, and he, was, he couldn't resolve that and reconcile it why couldn't he? Well, at least one reason is because he wasn't listening to his own contemporaries who said, yes, it's going to happen, but zoom out farther. Get, get the bigger picture. God has to punish Israel because of her sin, but that's not the end. God will restore it. 
In other words, Jonah himself failed to process because he didn't get the big picture. And so I think, I mean, that seems to be much of our discussion has revolved around that last night and tonight. And I think maybe that's the big takeaway that a lot of us are having is that, you know what, the book of Jonah teaches us we have got to get the big picture and trust God. Even when I don't understand my current circumstance, trust that God is in the business of being just, being merciful, being consistent. I may not get the whole big picture, but God is not going to betray us. God is always true to his character, and we can trust him even if we don't understand everything that's going on. And that's what Jonah failed to do, and if we're not careful, we'll repeat Jonah's mistake. But... Yeah, he was from Judah, and he went north, and they kept trying to kick him out. Yeah, well, so then Jonah's got Yeah. Yeah, I mean, again, it's, it's really sad. But I encourage you, go and read Amos 9, Hosea 14. It's a good way to end our study, to see what God promised would ultimately happen to Israel, and how had Jonah believed that, he would not have been wrestling with the issues in the same way that he did in chapter 4. He would be able to process and reconcile these ideas if he listened to the word of God. And that's, that's what we need to do. All right, there's the moral of the story. So I know we're out of time. Praise the Lord for this week. Boy, I've had a fun time. Thanks for coming and participating. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you so much for this time tonight. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for the book of Jonah and what it has had in store for us. We pray that as we continue, to study it on our own and in days to come, that you would just allow it to continue to enrich us, bless us, challenge us, expose within us the same attitudes and inconsistencies that was in Jonah and help us, Lord, to see and, and not just be, as James says, a hearer of the word, but may we also be a doer of the word. May we live out these principles that we've learned for your glory and our good. So thank you for this week. We bless your holy name for allowing us to enjoy it together. And we ask that you would uh, continue to allow it to bear fruit in our lives for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.